so happy to be going first. And I, I am talking about space. <laughs> All right, so I've spent a decade collecting data with persons facing housing instability and homelessness, and whose stories increasingly are intersecting with transportation and digital disadvantages. A theme that has emerged is spatial injustice. Edward Soha's theory of the city as a source of structural racism and discrimination. So modern spatial injustice started with redlining systematically denying investments in communities designated as poor financial risks using color-coded maps. Blue blocks were first grade investments, red blocks fourth grade. Here's Knoxville's map from 1940. Redlining institutionalized spatial injustice. Redlining began when the Federal Housing Administration refused to issue mortgages in and near predominantly African-American neighborhoods in the 1930s. Home ownership is the number one way to accrue wealth in the states, Today, 74% of white house Americans own a home compared to just 46% of black Americans. The impact of Knoxville's historic redlining is evident. In the early 20th century, East Knoxville was a thriving part of the city. Today, its main thoroughfare, Magnolia Avenue, was marked by economic disinvestment, low property values, and some of the city's highest pedestrian fatalities. So redlining also produced easy targets for public housing and urban renewal. The 1937 Housing Act funded a critical resource, public housing, but it was often built where land was cheap in red line neighborhoods. In Knoxville, persons living east of not downtown, disproportionately black, were evicted and moved to public housing, frequently in East Knoxville, and white households fled west. The red line maps of the 1930s became literal lines in the land with the passage of the Federal Aid Highway Act of the, in 1956. This national roadway system created urban landscapes centered on car ownership and longer commutes, and ultimately made public buses less efficient for daily travel in the typical low-density U.S. city. Highway construction traced the red line maps of the 30s and created physical barriers between white and black communities. In addition, the construction often displaced and destroyed entire neighborhoods, particularly in red line communities where land was cheap and residents were disproportionately black and African American. Such structural inequities have produced resource deserts, where residents of red line neighborhoods face substantial barriers to accessing jobs, education, healthcare, and other essential services due to inadequate transportation infrastructure, disparately low public investment, and lack of economic opportunity. So why did I, as a researcher, start talking about spatial justice? 10 years ago, I began studying how persons experiencing homelessness could get back on their feet. When I interviewed women in family shelters, what I heard over and over and over again was, I need a car. That's what I need. What I kept hearing was essentially the lived experience of Soha's spatial injustice. People were telling me I can't get to work. I can't get to the door or to the doctor. I spend all day waiting. As one person whom I interviewed said, wait, you just have to sit and wait. You miss out on everything else. Interestingly, spatial injustice also maps neatly onto digital disparities. Here is one striking example from the city of New Orleans. Communities that lack internet access in 2022 overlay almost perfectly with the red line districts from the original 1930s red line map. So, suppose you live in a historically red line neighborhood in Knoxville. If you don't own a car, and you can't telecommute because of digital disparities, and you can't take Uber, why not take the bus? Well, it would take you an hour and 10 minutes, according to Google Maps, to get from east to west Knoxville, and you'd have to take two buses and walk across busy roads. Moreover, housing choice is a luxury. Woman living in a shelter for survivors of intimate partner violence in Knoxville told me that affordable housing near higher paying jobs just doesn't exist. Now, HUD does offer vouchers to subsidize the private market, but as one woman said, there's a waiting list for a waiting list. As these quotes are highlighting, the transit deserts and the digital deserts that people have described are aligning with essentially service deserts, jobs, healthcare, food, cell phone coverage, essentially producing a built environment that is characterized by spatial injustices. So not surprisingly, 
My most recent interviews have also identified that issues of environmental injustices are connected directly to where people live. As one person said so well, the power plants that we build to support our increasingly electrified world are built within our lowest income red line neighborhoods. So spatial justice means equity. We've all seen images of this, resource, of this image, but look at the final panel. Equity is not just extra boxes so that everyone can see over the same fence. Equity is no fence. Eliminate the red lines and the physical barriers. So what might an equity model mean in the context of housing? It's all about supply. Increase the quantity and the quality of that supply. We need more, we need more diverse, and we need more spatially distributed housing stock. We need to incentivize and revise zoning laws to support housing developments, particularly in redlined historic neighborhoods that fit different family structures and income levels. What about public transportation? Let's diversify public transit and make it a resource for all rather than something that people without a car use as a last resort. In Europe and Asia, there have long been examples of multimodal and connected public transit systems, street legal golf carts, electric mopeds, electric bikes that facilitate short trips and connect to buses and trains. In 2022, Knoxville's Community Development Corporation received a choice neighborhood grant from HUD to achieve this type of urban redevelopment in Western Heights. It envisions a co-design model of new housing, reinvestments in public schools, economic development, and expanded transportation options. Let's make quality housing, mobility, the internet, and environmental justice universal rights. Let's erase the red lines of the 20th century and design our cities such that people have access to these public goods. In so doing, we will achieve a truly spatially just city.